We're done. Good. Right. Good morning, everybody. Good morning, everybody in the room, and good morning to everybody online. Again, thank you for waiting for those online. Uh, and the room is now filled up nicely. Good morning to everybody. Um, my name is Jason Bennett. I'm the Director of Salvage Services at ABL, and I'll be hosting uh, this morning's presentation. Uh, our more briefing this morning is accredited by the Chartered Insurance Institute, uh, and delegates can claim up to one hour CPD points for your participation. For that reason, we will be keeping record of participants in the room today. If you haven't already signed up at the desk, please do so on your way out afterwards, uh, and then we'll be able to follow up with the email to award the points. For those online, we'll also keep track of yourselves, and you will receive a follow-up email with your CPD certification. So let's take a look at today's presenters. Um, our technical presenters, Sylvia Start and Amy Barker, are both naval architects and they're with the engineering design analysis branch of the ABEL group, which is Longitude Engineering. Uh, together, they've worked on a number of Longitude projects in low to zero emission vessel design, as well as in alternative fuel engineering. And today they'll be sharing their thoughts including insights into Longitude's project High Seas 3, which I'm reliably informed by the notes right in front of me, is Europe's first zero emissions hydrogen fuel cell seagoing passenger and car ferry, on which they both worked. And we look forward to hearing more from you. Don't look so nervous, it'll be fantastic. And we're also very pleased to welcome Shrey to our maritime market briefing team today. He's just joined us in the London office. Uh, Shrey is on the ABL Group Engineering Development Scheme as a graduate, uh, following a stint at ABL Aberdeen office, uh, where he was working to support the Marine Warranty Survey Department. Shrey is now with us in London, supporting the Maritime Casualty Investigation Team. Welcome, Shrey. And I've already introduced myself, so I'll forget those notes. Um, please note the usual caveats apply, Chatham House rules, so contents can be discussed but not attributed outside of the room. And please also remember uh, that the information contained in today's presentations and any opinions or comments expressed by the presenters, including myself, uh, are not necessarily those of the ABL, but of the presenters themselves. At the end of today's briefing, can we please ask everyone takes three minutes to, of their time to complete the online survey. This is crucial for us uh, for our CPD accreditation and continue, allows us to continue offer you one hour CPD points per briefing. It also means that we can all receive feedback and adapt our presentations to the changing requirements of the audience. In front of you now, you see the slide for the Neptune Declaration on C4 wellbeing and crew change. And we do ask that you give a few minutes thought for the seafaring men and women at sea today. And even though COVID-19, <clears throat> excuse me, does seem to be increasingly in the rearview mirror, uh, we know that seafarers are still finding it difficult. They're working often longer than they're meant to uh, due to crew change issues. And of course, a multitude of issues affect their factors uh, in the ongoing world today and can impact adversely on their lives and their conditions at sea. Uh, many of our own colleagues, including myself, uh, come from seafaring backgrounds. So crew welfare is a cause that's close to our hearts. So as such, we are a signatory to the Neptune Declaration, uh, which has undoubtedly played a part in many improvements of the lives of seafarers today. And we would ask that you just take a moment to look into this and perhaps maybe consider getting your own organizations as signatories. Now, without further ado, over to today's presenters. Uh, hello everyone. Uh, so today we're going to be talking about the engineering uh, behind net zero ships. So firstly, as our maritime market briefing is CPD accredited, we have some learning objectives. Uh, these are to understand the requirement for maritime transition to net zero and gain knowledge of current trends in clean shipping. To learn about existing longitude net zero emission uh, ship design projects and understand challenges and design risks of developing low or zero emission ship technologies. 
And finally, to understand current and future opportunities in the net zero shipping sector. So we will firstly briefly cover why there is a need for net zero ships, as you are likely aware of this already, uh, followed by some current trends in clean shipping. So as a whole, the maritime industry is aiming to transition to net zero in the future, which is largely driven by the IMO, the IMO's greenhouse gas strategy. So the figure on the right shows a portion of the timeline of emission goals set out by the IMO. So starting with where we are now in 2023, uh, currently, EEXI survey requirements have taken effect and carbon intensity data has begun to be collected. As we move into the future, into 2030 and 2050, uh, this is where we start to see emission targets come in. So in 2030, there is an aim to have an average of a 40% reduction in CO2 emissions across international shipping compared to 2008, which then increases to a 70% reduction in CO2 emissions and a 50% reduction in all greenhouse gas emissions by 2050. This is no easy task, hence the need for all ships to reduce their emissions. So the most effective way to reduce ship emissions is to power a ship with an alternative fuel which has net, which has net zero or low emissions. This figure from DMV shows the number of ships that are powered by alternative fuels over recent years. So it can be seen from this that the amount of alternative fuel ships is increasing relatively rapidly, with the majority of them currently using LNG. Uh, this is likely since this is an area where learnings can be taken from LNG vessel propulsion and easily applied to current ship designs without much change in vessel layout or machinery. It should be noted, though, that the proportion of ships powered by other alternative fuels, such as methanol and hydrogen, is increasing as we look into the future, uh, as new technologies become online. So here we take a clearer look at the proportions of ships on order powered by alternative fuels. For all ships on order, the larger proportion of ships are to be fueled by LNG. However, looking at new ship contracts in 2023 alone, the largest portion are powered by methanol. This shows that the most uh, appropriate fuel or turn to fuel is changing as we move into the future. Many factors do affect which alternative fuel is best for a ship, which we will explore further. Uh, it is, however, important to note that the energy density of these solutions is not as high as conventional diesel powered ships. Therefore, typically more space is required for fuel storage and equipment. This pushes the price up and does not make them competitive with a like for like diesel powered vessel. The reality is that legislation will be required to force the industry into adopting these fuels. Many factors affect the choice of alternative fuel for ships. So the first one we're going to talk about is fuel availability. So this is considering is a fuel readily available now? And if it is, is it available along the target ship route? Uh, for some alternative fuels such as hydrogen or ammonia, new port infrastructure and storage may be required to safely support ship refueling. The next factor is uh, how is fuel produced? So some alternative fuels are currently produced using energy intensive, high emission methods. This is an important factor to consider when looking at well to weight emissions of the ship. There may be a fuel which is not completely zero emissions when used on board, but can be made using green energy or lower emission methods. Hence, the welterweight commissions of this fuel could be more favorable than a fuel such as grey hydrogen. Uh, this is not necessarily a new consideration, but fuel prices are important to consider for the owner. For example, some alternative fuels such as ammonia already have large market for fertilizer, which has benefits in terms of production, but means that long term, high fuel prices be may, be, may be maintained unless the production is scaled up. The last two factors are the main ones that we consider at longitude. Uh, the first is ship type and the use and the size of the vessel are, uh, play a significant factor when choosing an alternative fuel for a vessel. For example, hydrogen fuel could be a good choice for short ship ferries due to their ability to refuel regularly, whereas for a large container ship, the volume of hydrogen tanks required would largely encroach on cargo space. So a more energy dense fuel such as LNG or methanol would be a better choice. So now we're going to look at some of Longitude's zero emission ship design case studies, starting with, as mentioned before, the High Seas 3. 
We are moving now towards a case study which brings to your attention our zero emission ferry design High Seas 3. Based on what we've discussed previously, uh, the aim of moving from traditional propulsion systems to net zero technologies are clear, and this will be the future. Uh, but where to start? So we as designers have accepted the challenge where there are considerable costs and risks involved in bringing new and emerging technology into ship design. Therefore, it is not surprising that publicly funded entities will be the first to bring such ships into the maritime industry. This is also how uh, our high seas project started. So the client is, in this case, is Caledonian Maritime Assets, who currently own or lease 26 ports in Scotland. And with that, they own 37 ferries. Uh, two of those are, are shown here. So the next thing to look at is what were the client's requirements for the vessel? So they wanted a double ended ferry with, to have a capacity of 120 passengers uh, with 16 cars or two HGVs and a quick loading and unloading operation. While double ended ferries are nothing new, a quick unloading operation is quite an unusual requirement for a ferry, especially on such short routes. The fourth requirement is the one that challenges uh, challenges our design as it was to be the first zero emissions hydrogen seagoing passenger ferry. So in this image, we can see a rendering of our concept for High Seas 3. Uh, the vessel has a length overall of 40 meters, a beam of 11.5 meters and a depth of 2.5 meters. The draft is relatively low at 1.6 meters, which makes the ferry suitable for use in sheltered waters. As you can see from the principal dimensions, uh, this is a relatively small ferry. This constrained and placed limitations on the design in a few areas, but we will touch on that in more detail. The propulsion system consists of two Voith Schneider propellers, uh, one located forward, st forward starboard and the other port side afts, which both provide propulsive power and maneuvering capability. To achieve net zero emissions operation, we have two primary sources of power for this vessel. The first being compressed hydrogen in PEM fuel cells and an energy storage system consisting of batteries. The ship will transit at a service speed of 9.5 knots using solely the hydrogen fuel and switching to uh, battery power in maneuvering, um, in maneuvering operations. The ESS will be able to provide a return to port speed of seven knots in a 15% C margin from the midpoint of the transit. Uh, an emergency diesel generator is currently included in the design. Uh, these were left as it increases the chances of approval, but we envisage that this is not required once the concept is tested and approved by first in class. So the ships, the ship's power management systems are configured to permit operation on fuel cells alone, ESS alone, or on a fuel cell ESS hybrid mode. The ferry operates in the hybrid mode while doing port operations and the batteries take part of the load while maintaining the fuel cells at their best efficiency point. Both batteries and fuel cells generate in direct current and are relatively easy to integrate into a single DC board, which is why they pair well together uh, as a powering option. In the event of failure uh, of the hydrogen system, the PMS will switch to ESS power only. The ship is primarily designed to operate between the ports of Kirkwall and Shapinze in the Orkney Islands. As Orkney is a well-known renewable energy hub due to its strong winds, tides and waves, the energy captured from these, from these power sources can be sent to the electricity grid or where there is an excess of energy, this could be used to produce green hydrogen. This therefore means that this vessel has the opportunity to not just be a zero emissions vessel, but also a net zero one. So the most frequently used process of approving novel or alternative designs is to obtain an approval in principle from the International Association of Classification Societies. This approval provides assurance that the system and structures on board uh, are bound by the scope of the AIP demonstrate an equal or enhanced level of safety to that which may be expected from a traditional or conventional structure. So now I'll hand over to Sylvia and she will go through the design challenges and solutions that using an alternative fuel presents. Well, 
As Amy mentioned earlier, designing ships that can use renewable fuel such as hydrogen doesn't come without challenges. As there are lots of safety risks involved, so in today's presentation I'm going to bring forward a couple of the decisions we had to make throughout the basic design process of High Seas 3, which, as mentioned before, is the world's first zero emission ferry. One of the challenges, if not the major challenge this process this project faced was that currently there are no established regulatory framework for alternative marine fuels such as hydrogen. Neither the IMO, flag states, nor class societies have satisfactory rules and requirements for hydrogen-powered ships. The IMO has, however, initiated a process to developing uh, these sets of rules, and there are already rules for fuel cells in the IGF code and DNV, but these do not cover the bunkering or storage of hydrogen. All in all, hydrogen is both familiar and different different than anything else in the energy system, as it ignites with very low energy, has a wide flammability range and a different dispersion than other gases due to its small molecule. Since codes and standards for maritime hydrogen were incomplete at the time of this project at least, it is necessary to apply the existing rules for other low flash point fuels covered in the IGF code and analyze how the physical behavior of hydrogen might enhance the requirement or even mitigate its need. Well, as we were deviating from the prescribed from the prescribed rules, a risk assessment was needed to prove that the chosen solution is providing an equivalent le safety level to the one required in solids. Um, moving on to another major challenge, which was finding a suitable location for the hydrogen tanks. Well, we started by identifying the areas where we actually cannot place the tanks. To do that, we followed the IGF code requirements, which states that the fuel tanks shall be located, shall be protected from external damage caused by collusion or grounding. Based on the ship's main dimensions, we had to calculate some minimum distances between the hull and the tank boundary. For example, in our case, the lower boundary of the fuel tank had to be at least 0.76 meters above the bottom shell plating and about 2.3 meters away from the side shell. We can see all this prohibited location on the current image. Well, now that we've clearly marked where we couldn't place the hydrogen tanks, let's see what other solutions we had. One option was to place them below the main deck. The disadvantage would be that the inspection and maintenance space for the hydrogen tanks would be limited. The pipes and valves could be difficult to access, and, in, and if any leaks occur, then these could easily gather between the frames and the structure. The space within the hydrogen compartment could, could be maximized by having these structural elements on the other side of the deck, which is a trick naval architects do when there is a space concern. But in this case, the deck above is actually the car's deck, so this option was not viable as it would impede the vehicle access. Having the hydrogen storage compartment below the main deck would also require the greater piping complexity and additional lines and equipments would be needed, such as dedicated ventilation lines and hazardous bilge pumps and tanks. To allow for a double protective barrier, and increase safety, we have actually considered inerting the compartment where the hydrogen tanks are stored, which implies additional hydrogen and oxygen detectors, nitrogen generators, and in the same time requires a very strict procedure when it comes to tank access and maintenance. We have to keep in mind that we talk about compressed hydrogen, meaning that a sudden release of such a large storage energy could exceed the design values of the bulkheads and the structure. Based on this, this solution was considered unfeasible for this project at least. Um, another option would be storing the hydrogen tanks on the main deck, but as a ferry, this is designed to carry vehicles and having the hydrogen tanks here would definitely reduce the capacity, which is a contract requirement and also one of the main requirements the client had. Uh, on the upper deck, the situation was quite similar with the addition that all the life-saving appliances are located here. Having the hydrogen tanks on the upper deck will therefore place the life rafts and potentially the rescue boats into a potential hazardous area, which is definitely against the SOLAS requirements. In the end, the only credible solution was to locate the hydrogen tanks to the bridge deck. Having the tanks on an external location possesses a series of advantages, 
which is such as uh, leakage can uh, dissipate relatively quick quickly, tanks are easier to maintain, access or even remove, it reduces double wall piping requirements and keeps the high pressure system out of the enclosed space, as hydrogen pressure will be reduced before it is delivered to the fuel cells. Uh, although the solution discussed of having the hydrogen bottles on the bridge deck was by far the best option, after hazard, a few other concerns were raised as both escape routes from the wheelhouse were inside a hazardous zone. Uh, we had to offset the wheelhouse to allow for the hydrogen tanks to be located only on one side and to maximize the distance to the vent mast. Uh, while developing this new arrangement, there were a few challenges as we had to maintain the visibility level while being able to stock the hydrogen tanks in an efficient and safe manner. A blast wall had also been added, but not detailed in the 3D rendering we can see on the screen. Um, it is also possible that there will be no windows on the inboard side of the wheelhouse and the view over the side may be by camera only. What isn't shown uh, in the image we can see is the dropped object protection, which will cover the area above the tanks and the tanks connections. This will mainly consist of a coursing grid, which does not overly impede the escape of hydrogen if it was to occur. Also on the bridge deck, there are some nitrogen storage bottles. This is required to maintain the pipe annulus inerted as well for, and also for purging the hydrogen pipes if that was required. Well, now that we've highlighted a few of the difficulties involved in designing uh, hydrogen fuel ships, we are moving towards a different alternative fuel. As Amy mentioned at the beginning of this presentation, methanol will become one of the most common fuel used for ship propulsion. We at Longitude have already been involved in the design of a 40 meter research vessel that uses methanol as an alternative, alternative source of fuel. And I'm now going to briefly present a few of the difficulties and challenges this project has raised. Well, if for high seas we were only talking about hydrogen fuel cells and batteries, in addition to this, this design integrates dynamic cells and also four generators used to provide the ship's propulsion and electrical power by either methanol or diesel. One of the challenges for this project was that was actually sourcing the dual fuel engines as none of the vendors approached were able to supply one by 2024 at least. There are of course methanol only engines, but the world, worldwide supply and availability of methanol when these vessels when this vessel enters into service was still a bit of an unknown. The solution was to design this ship methanol ready, meaning that it is designed to carry and use methanol and it fulfills all safety requirements such as cover dumps around methanol tanks, emergency escapes and hazardous zoning around tanks, bunkering spaces and vent masts. Dual fuel kits for new or existing diesel engines are under development and one of these will be used to convert the engine from diesel fuel to methanol once the client determines the methanol supply network is resilient enough. Well, we've talked a real about the first zero emission ferry, but Longitude are also the ones who designed the world's first zero emission electric service operation vessel. Uh, it was just announced on Monday that one of our designs, the zero emission electric service operation vessel received the ZEVI founding. This SOV can run either on methanol or on batteries, and it has various operational profiles, meaning that the batteries can be charged either onshore or offshore if offshore power is available, or in transit by using the methanol fueled generators. Well, this design probably deserves a presentation on its own, so I won't get further more into details at this stage at least. Uh, and now to close out, we will take a brief look at the future outlook for the net zero shipping industry and the opportunities it presents. Uh, looking to the near future, due to IMO guidelines, it is clear that a large number of new net zero vessels are required in a relatively short amount of time to meet the IMO emissions targets. The, the reality is that legislation will be required to force the industry into adopting these fuels. This has been proven in the past with ballast water management regulations, for example. Owner and operators will need will not change until they are forced to do so or it becomes economically viable. 
Once it happens, new ship types such as hydrogen or ammonia carriers will be required to transport these alternative fuels. For these new technologies to become viable, vendors must, must achieve classification society type approval for shipyards and clients to have confidence in these solutions. This has been an issue with a number of vendors as the approval pro process requires a lot of investment and is actually quite slow at the moment. Uh, these upcoming changes to the ship design industry present many opportunities for current and new stakeholders within the shipping industry. To name a few, there is room for growth of shipyards and shipyards workers in order to produce ships fast enough to meet the IMO targets. Large quantities of alternative fuels will need to enter the market to replace existing marine fuels. New storage solutions and port infrastructure will be required to accommodate and allow for safe bunkering of alternative fuels. And finally, to aid shipping fuel efficiency in general, there is room for fuel efficiency device industry to grow with technologies such as wing sails, kites, and air lubrication gaining popularity nowadays. This brings us to the end of our presentation and to recap, we hope that you now understand the requirements for maritime transition to net zero and gain knowledge of current trends in clean shipping. Learn about existing longitude net zero emissions ship design projects, understand the challenges and design risks of developing low or zero emission ship technologies, and finally, understand current and future opportunities in the net zero shipping sector. Thank you. Great. Morning, everyone. Uh, the purpose of this section of the briefing is simply to keep you updated on some of the recent higher cost cases that APL have been involved in, and in doing so, show you or remind you of uh, the sorts of instance, uh, incidents and casualties that can happen in shipping and marine operations. But in case some of you haven't attended these briefings before, uh, you might be asking, what are these so-called case reports? Well, uh, these feature largely, but not exclusively, hull and machinery casualties with estimated costs of repair in excess of $250,000, uh, usually excluding salvage costs. They cover only a subset of the total ABL group caseload, which of course includes many other areas apart from just H&M, uh, typically between 10 and 20% by ABL case numbers. These case reports are also a significant subset of our H&M work for although they only cover about 20 to 25% of the cases by number, uh, they cover around 65 to 75% of the H&M cases we survey by cost. I've been notified of 13 high cost cases during August, and it's one of those rare occasions when no engine room machinery cases have appeared. Uh, the blue columns in this graph show the proportional distribution by casualty type. Note uh, no blue for machinery. What we've got though is uh, one fire damage, four elision cases, although two of those are from the same incident, one propeller damage, two structural damages, two thruster damages, two stern tube bearing problems, and one crane incident. As always, with such a small sample set, you are bound to have the gaps in the distribution that you see here when uh, comparing it to the distribution for the whole year, uh, in this case, the whole of 2022, given as the gray columns. But as I said, rarely do we see the engine room machinery category empty, uh, this type being the most common loss type. Anyway, uh, here we've added in the distribution of those same 13 cases by their total costs. And you can see we have a bit of a spike for collisions and elisions. That's because one of the elisions involved a large cruise ship and even minor looking damages on these vessels uh, tend to end up being expensive. In terms of casualty proportions by number, you can see that this year's trends are shaping up to a similar pattern as last year. Nothing particularly unusual appears to be happening, uh, yet at least, regarding the relative instance of the different casualty types. Uh, and here we've added in the proportion of the cumulative costs. The relative costs of the machinery cases is still high when compared to the past, where, as we've said before, uh, we would have expected the red column to be only two, half to two thirds of the height of the blue column. The average cost for the year to date is still a bit lower than expected, coming in at only $680,000 compared to that 
long-term observed face value average of a million dollars, but there's still a third of the year to go. Anyway, let's move on now to look at some of the August cases in more detail. We've selected seven of them, uh, if we have time to go, go through all of them. And bear in mind that although we say these are August cases, the first month generally refers to when the first advice comes in from our surveyor. Some of the cases, therefore, may actually be from earlier months. First up, we have a Panamax-sized bulk carrier that was minding her own business, loading a cargo of wheat in a river port in the Americas, when a general cargo vessel decided to hit her just half of her port shoulder. No one was injured, thankfully, but our Balco suffered breaching of her number one topside and double bottom tanks, the latter being below the waterline. This all happened at about 10 in the morning on a bright, sunny, dry and hot day. There was no wind and no vis uh, visibility issues. I understand that the general cargo ship was attempting to leave the port and enter the ship channel, but clearly things didn't go quite the way they planned. I haven't heard that there was any steering or power failure that could explain things. Uh, in the absence of anything like that, it would have to come down to an embarrassing blunder in navigation. Anyway, here's our bulk carrier, now moored, moored in the opposite way around for inspections and repair at a local shipyard. You can see some signs of contact just aft of the forecastle. Moving up closer, we can see the scraping and breaching that occurred in way of the number one topside tank. Although the breach was more of a split rather than this uh, large rectangular hole, uh, which they have started cropping out, uh, where, which is where they've started cropping out the damaged steel. And uh, being true detectives, we can see uh, that we must be looking for a culprit colored blue. This upper damage will have come from the other ship's prow. We're going to move up to that portable generator set now and look forwards and down toward the waterline to see the lower damage. And you can just see a localized indentation that will have come from the vessel's bulbous bow. Let's now move up to the bow area. Here in the right picture, you can see the same indentation and the breach into the double bottom tank that occurred. When I uh, saw the picture on the left, taken further forward, I thought it could be deeply significant as it shows a distinctly bulbous bow shaped image on the side of the hull. Uh, but it turns out this had nothing to do with the casualty. It's just a wet pattern on the paint from water dripping uh, down from the port horse pipe. Back to the upper contact area. Here we see our surveyor's digital markup of the damages on uh, one of his photos. Obviously, it's important to know exactly where the damage is so that you can refer to the ship's drawing to get the thickness of plating and the sizing of the internal stif stiffeners for estimating the cost of repairs. Let's go into the topside tank now to see how things look there. This is actually before they started cropping the side wall, and you can see that the actual breach was more of a simple longitudinal split of the plating. We're inside the number one cargo hold now, and uh, you can see the access holes that have been created to get to the damaged area within the ballast tank that is just at the boundary between the slope plate and the ship's side. You can see that a number of the side shelf frames within the hold have been distorted too. Some got good fortune here. Uh, had the drafts of the vessel been slightly different, the cargo hold might have been breached. Overall, of course, not a massive damage as the impact occurred at low maneuvering speed, but with American prices, the costs have still reached half a million dollars. Now what's this? It's a general cargo ship with crumpled port prow and it's colored blue. Yes, this is the other ship that did the damage. She looks a bit forlorn and embarrassed. Let's have a look at her damage. Here's a general view looking down onto the forecastle deck. The bulwarks are obviously distorted, but the deck too has been crumpled by the impact. Here we see some of the damaged internals within the forecastle store, as you might have expected. And here you can see creasing of the main deck has occurred as well. Let's enter the four-peak tank now through that manhole to see if we can see any damage in there. 
The ship is part loaded at the moment, so we, we can't readily see the damage from the outside. It's not the clearest of pictures, and the lighting and shadows uh, of some of the stiffeners look a bit strange. But yes, you can just see an inset of the plating and horizontal stiffening at the forward port area of the bulbous bow. Okay, overall, not an awful lot of damage to this ship either, but a similar quantum of loss at half a million dollars here as well, reflecting not only the local repair prices, but also probably a near 50-50 share in the absorption between the two vessels of the kinetic energy. Uh, Moving on, here we have a pretty sophisticated vessel that not only has a pipeline capability, but also assists in general construction and heavy lifting activities offshore with her 1200 ton lifting capacity crane. She had just completed a lifting operation on a jacket offshore in the Middle East, and the crane operator was retracting the main hook block uh, to its top stowage position. Unfortunately, the vessel was over retracted and crunched into the upper sheaves. This photo taken by one of the crew at the time is not very sharp, but you can see the main hook block uh, has been pulled up tight to the upper sheaves, which of course shouldn't happen. Just to explain what's what, uh, on the right here is an inter internet picture of the arrangement of the hook block and upper sheaves of a different smaller crane. Remember the clever lever-like principle of crane rigging? Suppose you want to lift 100 tons on the hook, with the hoist wire wound four times around the sheaves in the hook block and the upper sheave block as seen here, the tension in each of the four segments of the hoist wire supporting the load would only be a quarter of the, hook on the, of the load on the hook. That is 25 tons. So the tension in the hoist wire leading back from the upper sheaves to the winch drum would likewise only be a little over 25 tons, allowing for some friction in the system. So you can get to lift 100 tons with just 25 tons of force. Quite brilliant. The only slight drawback is that for every meter in height you want to lift the load, you have to wind four meters of hoist wire onto the drum. But that's hardly a big problem. Anyway, back to the incident at hand. See this little weight dangling on a chain uh, and encircling one of the hoist strands? Its chain is connected to a cutout switch for the hoist winch. If the hook block reaches the weight and lifts it, the tension in the chain will be removed. The cutout switch should be activated and the hook block should stop its upward mo movement. For some reason, this system in our subject crane didn't work and the consequences are as seen on the left. For all that buildup, the damage isn't that dramatic. Here we see damage to the upper sheave block guard. Here you can just see that several of the sheaves themselves have been deformed and disturbed. It's a bit clearer when uh, where the hoist wire is removed. The upper block is dismantled now. Uh, here you can see the typical damage to the individual sheaves. Here's a broken bearing seal. And here you can see a slight bend in one of the flaps or sidewalls of the upper sheave block and damage to the inner support structure as well. With the hook right at its topmost position, localized damages were found at the end of the hoist wire at the 11 meter and 24 meter positions from the end attachment at the top end of the boom. I understand they have plenty of reserve wire on the hoist drum and that they can simply crop that first 25 meters off the hoist wire as part of the repair. That does mean that they'll have to reattach the spell to socket uh, end connector onto the newly cut end of the hoist wire. You can see the location of this hoist wire connector in the left photo. Looking at the right hand photos, it turns out uh, they would have had to reattach the socket anyway as the anchoring compound that binds the splayed uh, strands of the end of the wire rope inside the neck of the socket had fractured during the incident. Anyway, not a huge cost again, but a uh, bit different from the normal set of cases that we see. Of course, as I've said, this sort of thing shouldn't happen. A crane operator and his banksman down below should be communicating about the position of the hook and so on all the time, and no reliance should ever be placed on any cutout safety switches in normal operation. They should only ever be used as a last resort. 
Next up, we have an unfortunate mishap with a very expensive cruise ship that you're probably all very aware of, with lots of coverage online. She broke her moorings in high winds at a Mediterranean port and drifted across the harbour onto a moored tanker. What do cruise ships have in common? Big superstructures and lateral windage areas. As an illustra illustration, in gale force conditions with 40 knot winds blowing directly on the side of a ship like this, you could have a couple of hundreds of tons of wind force to deal with. So if you're alongside, you have to be very careful about the amount and layout of mooring lines you put out and be prepared to harbor, to leave harbor, to ride out a storm if strong winds are forecast or experienced. In the case in question, the vessel certainly got caught out in some way and investigations are underway to establish where exactly the deficiencies were. I myself am not party to those investigations, but I can imagine the sorts of questions that will be being asked. How good were the weather forecasts? How good were the mooring arrangements for the conditions that were forecast and those that actually occurred? What was the condition of the mooring lines? What was the readiness of the engines? How good was the decision making on board? And so on. From videos posted online, here are a couple of stills. On the left, a passenger looks out from their balcony at a very windy at very windy conditions and across the harbor towards the tanker that the crews would end up hitting. On the right, a dock worker films the moments when the aft mooring line snaps. And here are a series of stills from an online video that claims to describe the incident and the trajectory of the ship. The source claims that this was the situation before the mooring lines broke, where it is understood that the cruise ship was subjected to high winds on her port side from the northwest. When the moorings broke, it would seem that the ship did not have sufficient propulsive capacity to get herself under control, and she started drifting across the harbor. Coming into contact with a tanker that was moored to the key of an oil terminal. Again, from an online video, here is a still of the final position before the cruise ship was able to get herself free with tug assistance and out of the harbor. From my armchair, I'm wondering whether the cruise ship was rather fortunate to have contacted the tanker as this seems to have acted as a nice big fender. Had the tanker not been in the way, the damage to the cruise ship from hitting the harbor breakwater and the oil terminal ski, which appears to be low down near the waterline, could have been a lot worse. Anyway, as I said, investigations are underway into all aspects of the casualty, including the damages to the tanker and the oil terminal key. Here, all we can do is look at the damages to the cruise ship. Uh, we, see along, uh, we see her alongside some time after the incident. Uh, our surveyor is getting a general view along the starboard side that hit the tanker. Nice straight lines, no gross distortion of the hull, which is good. But of course, there are several contact points along the length of the ship. Perhaps two main ones. First here, forward on the side of the main hull. Taking a more oblique view, you can see that the side shell has been set in in this area. And this has affected some of the internal decks and stiffeners, plus one of the side shell access doors. One of the 305 person capacity lifeboats at main deck level just above was also badly damaged, probably beyond economical repair. Here we see a sample of the damaged frames on the left and on the right set in an uplift of one of the decks in the ship's casino, though it's hard to see the damage with that pattern on the carpet. And here, though not obvious again, is distortion or uh, to structure in way of one of the side shell access doors. The second major contact point seems to have been here, aft, uh, a life raft deck that overhangs the ship's side. The life raft mountings in the area have been distorted, and at least three of the 158 person capacity life rafts are considered unrepairable. Plus, we have various other less obvious but still expensive damages in other locations. It's early days in the assessment, but we're probably looking at a few million dollars worth of repairs. But of course, that's not the end of the story. There's the damage to the tanker and the oil terminal key to look at. We'll hopefully be able to report, report on that later in the year.
The fire damage we had this month was to a fairly new luxury motor yacht that was tied up in a European marina. The owner and his family had secured the yacht in the late afternoon, and at around four in the morning, the night watchman of a nearby hotel that overlooks the marina noticed the smell of burning. Having checked the hotel itself and found nothing, he went outside and saw smoke coming from the yacht. He called the fire brigade, who are reported to have attended within 10 minutes, and they proceeded to tackle the fire. The fire crew had to break several windows to gain access to tackle the source of the fire. The source appears to have been in way of a void space below the windscreen that held the vi wiper motors. Here, indeed, in this view, you can see very obvious scorching of the windscreen itself. As well as direct fire damage, most materials in the vicinity and throughout the vessel have been affected by heat or smoke or water damage from the efforts to fight the fire. An early estimate of $625,000 is given here, but this may change if more damage is uncovered once repairs begin. Investigations are underway to determine the cause of fire. Was it an electrical fault in the wiper motors or associated power supply? Was something left on that shouldn't have been? Were there known problems with any of the yacht's circuitry? And so on. Finally, we have two bulk carriers, sister ships in the same shipping company that have suffered near identical damages to their horse pipe extension structures or anchor beds. These serve to keep the anchors and chains away from the ship's hull when the anchors are dropped or raised and when the ship is at anchor. Now, uh, these have to be quite robust, not only to handle the forces associated with the anchors and chains, but also to withstand sea loads. You can see that they are very close to the waterline in the fully loaded condition, and that the impact loads from slamming on the bottom of these structures when the ship pitches and heaves is likely to be considerable, especially since the vessels have no bulbous power. Anyway, it looks like one of these were not robust, uh, robust enough as they have suffered from settings on their undersides. Here's another view where you can see the setup and discontinuity of curvature of the structure. These structures are welded to the ship's side, so the only way to get into them is by cutting a hole from the outside or from the adjacent void spaces within the forecastle. Inside, our surveyors dis uh, discovered an internal bracing system that had been retrofitted in December of 2022. So clearly some distortion had, uh, had been evident before the most recent Atlantic crossing, which saw the damage magnified and which triggered the present claim. This frame system appears to have been pretty ineffectual, I'm not aware of the sea conditions for the most recent voyages of the two vessels affected being anything out of the ordinary. So everything seems to be pointing to an inadequacy in the structure or a design fault. A proposal for the way ahead, I understand, is to install additional stiffening of the lower plate uh, between the renewed radial stiffeners of the original design, which buckled. This is all being discussed with the shipbuilders, owners, and class, and I'm sure everyone's being very understanding and reasonable. The $500,000 for each of the two ships reflects European prices, and I understand that two more vessels in the fleet may appear in the next months with similar problems. Anyway, that's all we have time for this month. I hope the cases have been of some, of some interest, and let me now hand back to Jason. Thank you for the uh, technical presentations. Found those very interesting throughout. Well done. And I believe we have a uh, little time for questions, uh, which we'll take both from the room and we have some already from online. Does anybody in the room have any questions? I see some hands up. Katie, are we using the microphone? Or no? You will have to use your voices. The microphone's off for today, so let's go. It's who's put the hand up? I saw. Yep. If you ask your question, I'll repeat it for the people online. And the question there for the people online was that the framework did not mention the IGC code and we're just asking what the reason that didn't feature uh, as we mentioned as regulatory framework.
We're just going to swap over now because all the, tech, all the questions are technical. Thankfully, nobody has questions about my presentation, so I'll just hand you over and they can answer the room. Is online? Okay. Uh, what I said that we've mostly for the first vessel design that I've mentioned in the presentation, we've mostly used the IGF code due to the fact that it applies or most of the regulations also apply to, to hydrogen. Um, in that, uh, in the presentation, I've also mentioned, like I said, the DMV handbook for hydrogen filled vessels, which proved to be quite useful for the other projects we had, but at that time that was not published at the time we were, me and my colleagues were developing this project. Thank you. We do have some questions online as well. Uh, shall I open the chat? Um, hello. So the first question is, hello, is there, any, is there a possibility that hydrogen or other fuel cells will be the ultimate solution, even for large high seas trading vessels? Well, of course, at this time, we can't really tell if this will actually be a solution for, for large high seas trading vessels. One of the reasons for that is that hydrogen uh, or that compressed hydrogen or stored hydrogen, even in the liquid form, actually takes a lot of the a lot of space in board. So this is why, as Amy mentioned, I think at the beginning of the presentation, hydrogen at least will be mostly used for for small vessels such as ferries, and it in the end probably it will depend a lot of the port capabilities as well, and as and also of how long the refueling time will take. So. We can't really tell at this stage, but from our opinion, hydrogen will mostly be used for smaller vessels. Yes. You want to ask? So uh, we have a question which says, uh, based on your studies, what is the main benefits of using hydrogen and fuel cells compared to batteries only for short route ferries and similar? Uh, so for this person, it seems like hydrogen uh, in an energy is is an, in an energy perspective uh, maybe a detour. Um, so for us, uh, using hydrogen um, compared to batteries only, uh, batteries are very heavy, uh, and for a small vessel uh, where weight can be a limiting factor um, hydrogen helps us because we can have less batteries uh, and reduce uh, the weight because uh, hydrogen uh, compressed hydrogen is very light okay well, i think that's it but i yeah i don't think we can answer those Thank you. Um, so that's a curveball throwing the uh, the question to the, the master mariner in the room about the predictions. Um, the, those in the room, I seem to have lost that one. Um, I cannot see in front of me. Katie, could you repeat the question? Right, so those online is whether we can predict the uh, impact of alternative fuels based on that most, uh, unlike this month where there were none, most uh, H&M claims are to deal with machinery breakdowns. 
Uh, and my understanding for talking with those people who do know is I think it's a little bit too early to determine that in itself. Uh, we've seen the variation in the fuels themselves are still to be decided. The technology is evolving. Some of the things are still being developed. Um, with any new things, maybe you do get a spate of incidents where as new instructions are brought in, but how that settles down is still to be determined. I've not been advised of anything which say will definitely will be a spike or an increase because of alternative fuels. That's my understanding. And I put forward before any expressed opinions are those of the presenters and not necessarily ABL, especially Master Mariner talking about engine damage. That's my current view. So that was a clarification or a, uh, an addition from a, a colleague who is actually an engineer. Thank goodness we have one in the room. Um, and the point there being for those online that with the early adopters, it tends to be people who are setting the trends and quite high quality value. So you may not do see the spikes there. In the second generation of like of adopters, you may see a few spikes initially, whilst those people get used to the new technology, which the smaller number of early adopters brought in. So there may be some initially, but as with most things, it tends to settle down into a trend at the end. I think that is what we have time for. Um, so if you could take three minutes to complete the uh, survey, we'd very much appreciate it. We do like your feedback. Uh, it does help us keep you in the CPD. It's on the screen there for now, watching online. It's available outside as well. Uh, if you haven't registered in the room, please then do so. I would like to thank you. Thank you for participating in the room. And thank you for participating online as well. With the follow-up email that comes to those who do register, there will be a chance also to enter a quiz and the prize draw, which will be announced uh, the next time. And when I put my glasses on, I'll tell you when the next time is. And the next one is the 12th of October, 0930, 10.30, same value at the old library. So thank you very much and thank you. <laughs>